The race to 5G is on, and the battle for talent is getting fierce. Welcome to 5G Talent Talk with Carrie Charles, a podcast dedicated to helping you face the future workforce head on. Navigate this challenging talent landscape with innovative strategies to attract, retain, and engage people in this new world of work, only here on 5G Talent Talk with Carrie Charles, CEO of Broadstaff Talent Solutions. Welcome to 5G Talent Talk. I'm Carrie Charles, your host, and I'm so happy that you joined me today. So I have with me Dr. Kent Wessinger, who was my first guest ever on 5G Talent Talk years ago. And I'm so excited because he said he would come back on the show. And I'm even more excited because the workforce has changed significantly since he first came on the show. And I really think that we need to hear a word for today for leaders about our new workforce. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Kent. Dr. Kent Wessinger is a people scientist and principal partner at Retention Partners. Dr. Wessinger's globally recognized research and five years of implementation experiences make him the expert on attraction, engagement, and retention of millennial and Gen Z employees and clients. He successfully helped Fortune 500 financial services companies, engineering firms, manufacturing companies, nationwide real estate and insurance firms, governments in North and Central America, nonprofits, and many small businesses develop a strategy to solve, and yes, I said the word solve, their workforce crisis. Kent is also a dear friend of mine and one of my new partners in Retention Partners. So Kent, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited. I cannot wait to have this conversation. Thank you. I'm honored and humbled not only to be on this podcast, but honored and humbled to be your friend. Thank you. Thank you. So Kent, let's start by just talking about your work, your research. I want to hear all about it, you know, and a little, maybe a little bit about how you started. Eight and a half years ago, I developed a research project because I really could not find any valid, legitimate information that leaders could depend on to solve their workforce crisis. Now, eight and a half years ago, there wasn't much of a workforce crisis. Many leaders didn't see a workforce crisis, but for some reason, I saw this swell beginning to come. And when I began to dig into it, I couldn't find much information at all, especially with the younger workforce, with millennials and as Gen Zs were, were just entering the workforce. And so I developed a research project hoping to get maybe 500, 1,000 participants in it so I could use that information and take to leaders so that there would be clarity about what was going on and what was about to happen. The research project is open-ended tracking the maturity of the generations as they assimilate into leadership positions, not only in the workplace, but in the community and in their homes. And so today, the research project has over 44,000 participants from 29 nations. The research has been implemented in companies with over 100,000 employees down to the last company that we just implemented the research in has eight employees in it. And so what I know based on that research and wherever it's been implemented, when leaders reach out to me, I not only can bring them an informed, tested, practical solutions, I can bring them information and implementation experiences that allow them to have some clarity and cast a little bit of vision and comfort into their workforce crisis, which ultimately feeds into their growth goals. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to just be the guy that's solving the workforce crisis, um, even though that matters. I want to be the guy that leaders look to and say, we solved the workforce crisis, and now we've achieved our growth goals. Hmm. And that's what that research project is, is continue. The foundation of it continues to feed on and feed for leaders all around the world in all different sectors of our economy. So talk about your company, Retention Partners. Well, I go back to the informed, tested, and practical side, providing solutions to the workforce crisis. And the reason that I like to hang my hat there is, well, let's just start with informed. One of the things that leaders continually communicated to me was, was that they were frustrated about investing resources, time, energy, money, 
into hypothetical or just, you know, hypothesized information that they thought would solve their workforce crisis. And then two weeks, a month, six months down the road, they still have the same workforce crisis. And, and one of the reasons for that is, is that there's just not a lot of tested information that's out there that's, that's specifically honed in and focused on these generations when it comes to the maturity and the decisions they're making inside the workforce. And so informed, I'm bringing them 44,000 participants from 29 nations and a lot of information, a lot of implementation experience. Tested, again, anybody can hypothesize what a solution to a workforce crisis is. Anybody can come up with any kind of theoretical concept. And what we know is that there's a lot of people that are throwing things against the wall and whatever sticks the longest, they're taking it, they're funding it, but they're still getting the same outcome. 44,000 participants from 29 nations where the information has been implemented in organizations. So we know what works and what doesn't work. But the outcome is this. I grew up in a small business family. My mother owned two real estate companies. She battled, you know, fighting kind of the big boys on the block many times. And what I learned not only from her, but from working with leaders, again, all over the world that are dealing with this is that they want practical, common sense solutions to solve their workforce crisis. Don't give me 12 things to do. Don't give me eight things to do. Give me one thing that will help my employee engagement. Give me one thing that will help retain my employees. Give me one thing that will help attract my employees. And when we provide those, knowing they're informed solutions and they've been tested, what we know is we know with absolute certainty When they take these practical solutions, we know what the outcomes are going to be. Now, let me add just one more thing to that. I know that the manufacturing sector, the healthcare sector, financial services sector, and a compartment of the technology sector is still struggling ridiculously bad with this workforce crisis. And let me just, let me start at the backside on technology. Technology is, we, 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 the headlines today are that technology companies are laying off people all over the world. And we know that many in the sector overhired just basically to grab the growth, no fault, not casting blame or judgment, to grab the growth during a moment where they could grab that growth. And some of them are coming back to the reality of, of where they should be. But however, What I know from working with a lot of leaders in the technology sector is that they're still struggling to attract, engage, and retain those workers that are in the field. I don't necessarily like the whole blue collar kind of designation, but what I do know is that they're struggling attracting, engaging, and retaining those workers that are in the field. Now, we can say the same thing. I I hear the same thing from manufacturing leaders, the, the employees that are in the plant. They're struggling with attracting, engaging, and retain them. Healthcare is a different bird. Healthcare from top to bottom, especially with the nurses, they're really struggling. Financial services, again, a whole nother paradigm. The average financial service employee today is almost 59 years old. They're really struggling from bottom up and they are, they're in trouble. There's just no way around it. They're in trouble. But the sector that's in the most trouble, especially attracting, engaging, retaining our younger workforce is the government. When it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to public safety, when it comes to social work, when it comes to just regular government offices, there's not one government office where leaders have reached out to me that they told me that they are over 50% capacity in their employees. Most of them are under 50% capacity. So I'm saying all that to say, if anybody is planting a seed in any leader's mind right now that this workforce crisis is coming to an end or it's, a, or it's over, it's nonsense. It's not true. There are many sectors that are still struggling and they're going to continue to struggle with this. This situation is not going to go away anytime soon. Yes, you are so right. And, you know, many people will say, you know, telecom is, you know, also technology industry. And but in telecom, we're struggling with the same thing, right? Attracting, retaining, engaging workers in the field, hourly workers. And we have more open jobs than people to fill them with many roles, right? And, you know, especially right now with, you know, with fiber and what's what's on the horizon with the the broadband builds and infrastructure bill. So the job market is still tight despite economic conditions. And 
I wanted to just go into a little bit more detail about you know this workforce crisis and what very specific challenges are you hearing that companies are experiencing today? Well, let's let's go down three: attract, engage, and retain. We'll just stay in those three veins right there. One of my clients three years ago, it's a we would it's a larger client. It's a Fortune 100 client. Three years ago, they told me that for every one job opening. They had in the field, I'm going to stick to the field workers right now, for every one job they had open in the field, they would have a minimum of, on average, of 25 applicants for that job. So they got to choose, they, they basically got to take top talent, put top talent in the field in every single one of their positions. That same client today tells me that for every one field job that they have open, they schedule 25 interviews and on average, 1.3 people show up for that interview. Yeah. Okay, so I know a lot of leaders are struggling to attract, not just recruit, but attract people into their organization, into their structure. That's one thing. The, the second piece is engagement. And, and I want to say that, and I hope that we'll be able to unpack this further in just a moment. I believe that engagement is the absolute key to um, attracting employees and retaining employees. What I know from the research is this, that only 4% of all organizations, and, and I'm looking at for profit here, only 4% of all for-profit corporations have a tested and informed employee engagement strategy, which get, tells me that is right at the heart of the, in, the workforce crisis. When we don't have an engagement strategy, we're going to remain on this recruiting hamster wheel, but we're going to struggle to retain the employees on the backside because there's a lack or a void of engagement there. So that employee engagement is the second piece. So attracting top talent, engaging our employee base, the second one, and retaining them. The overwhelming majority of leaders that come to me, they come to me with that one word, we can't retain our employees. We're struggling to retain our employees in the field. We're struggling to, to retain our nurses. We're struggling to retain our guys, our people coming into the warehouses. We're struggling with, uh, and so that retention issue becomes a big deal. Now, what my research tells me is that today, it costs an average of $34,000 to replace one employee. I've discovered that the overwhelming majority of leaders are not factoring that in any kind of financial structure, budgets, forecast, anything. So then the question is, where is that coming from? It comes from bottom line profitability, whether we like it or not. So as leaders are beginning to take note of what this retention issue is costing them, not just from a productivity perspective, from, from a bottom line perspective, they want this, they're desperate, I will say, desperate to see their retention rates increase. What I've noticed is that, the, again, the overwhelming majority of leaders have come to the place that they feel the only way to solve their retention issue is to pay more. And I can tell you pay, even though it's critically important, it is not the solution to retention. And so attract, engage, and retain, those are the three major pieces that we're dealing with the workforce crisis. When we can get those right, when we can have those practical solutions implemented. And I got to tell you, my implementation experience shows me that retention, most people think it's impossible to solve. It's not. And I, I'll even argue it's not even hard to solve. When we take this, this information this and, and this tested information and the practical solutions that it provides and we implement them, what we know is this. We can improve retention rates by 63%. And that's growing. We know that for absolute certainty, 63%. Anybody that says they can solve your, your retention rate by 100%, I would encourage you to run from that person and not give them one penny. But we know that we can increase, increase it by 63%. And I got to tell you, I don't know. I, I, there may be other people out there that can do it. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen a research project, nor have I seen practical solutions that align or come close to what we're providing right now. That's great. So Kent, let's get into some of these practical solutions and, you know, some of the actual strategies that leaders can use in order to attract, engage and retain. But let me ask you first, because I want to understand there's obviously there's generational conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and how that 
we in the older category, I'm 55. So, you know, how we see the younger workforce, right? Versus how the younger workforce sees themselves. So where is the opportunity here? Well, I'm 59. So I am technically a baby boomer. You are technically a Gen X, by the way. And let's just think about this. The first question in the research project, as soon as you jump, the very first question in the research project asks, what's the first word that comes to your mind when you think of a millennial? When that's asked to baby boomers and Gen X, entitled, lazy, and selfish are the first three terms. Continue to be the first three terms from 500 participants to over 44,000. When we ask the same question to millennials and Gen Z, all of the younger workforce, which by the way, let's not overlook the fact They are the largest block of the workforce currently right now, and that's not going to change anytime soon. So when we combine those two and we ask them that same question, what's the first word that comes to your mind when you think of a millennial? And now we ask, what's the first word that comes to your mind when you think of the younger workforce? When we ask it to them, creative, innovative, and smart are the top three answers. So in title, lazy, selfish, creative, innovative, smart, two different employees, two different mindsets, two different perspectives. But I would also argue this, two different types of leaders. Who are we going to lead into profitability? Entitled, lazy, selfish, or creative, innovative, smart? And if we know how to tap into creative, innovative, smart, which that's what our practical solutions do, help help leaders tap into that, all of a sudden, what we have is we have a structure that's producing creative, innovative, smart, not only ideas, but concepts and realities and growth. Where if we're sitting in the seat of judgment and just saying entitled, lazy, selfish, I promise you, you cannot keep them in your building. You cannot keep them in your organization. They're not going to stay with that mindset. And so when it comes to the way they see themselves, it's, it's critical that we tap into that innovative, creative, smart mindset that they provide and they bring into the building and into the, the, the company structure. So we, as you know, Gen X, baby boomers, we need to actually have a paradigm shift in the way that we are viewing the younger generation. Like, it, in other words, you know, what we believe will happen, right? And I, I truly believe this, that if you believe someone is great and you believe someone can do it and you believe in someone, then it gives them power and they can feel your belief in them. So is that what part of this is, is that mindset shift and kind of a perception shift of my gen- our generation. Yeah, absolutely. Carrie, look, let's look at it from the other side of the coin as well. I mean, ultimately, all of us as leaders, no matter what sector we're in, whether we're in technology or telecom or healthcare, manufacturing, financial services, government, what, what, whatever we're in, ultimate, our ultimate aim and goal it boils down to one thing, growth. I mean, we're measured by growth. Our, our, you know, what we accomplish is measured by growth. It's not measured by survival. It's measured by how, how well can or how exponentially even can we grow our organization. And, in, and ultimately, if we're judged by growth, what we know is this, is that we, we want the best employee base that we can possibly have providing that growth for our structure. So we have to empower them, not only from a mental perspective of in the way that we see them, innovative, creative, smart. I can go on down the list. There's about 10 more adjectives there that we can describe. If we empower them with the right tools in the right structures for those things to be produced, to become realities, what happens is, is we as a leader experience the reality of growth. But if we fail to tap into those things, or we fail to provide those structures of innovative, creative, smart, and on and on, then the outcome is not going to be growth. It's going to be digression. Hmm. I I love that. So I want to talk about this, you know, the, the just challenges for leaders today, remote and hybrid work and the needs and demands of the new workforce is just a major challenge for leaders, especially in the area of accountability. And in your, from your view, what does accountability mean to today's workers? And how do we hold this new workforce accountable? I mean, I hear complaints all the time saying, you know, that, that it's, it's a challenge. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of the core concepts that I begin with when I go into an organization. 
And the reason for that is, is that what my research and information, you know, uh, and implementation experience has showed me is that leaders, and I'm even going to go so far as say seasoned leaders are growing more and more timid about holding their younger workforce accountable for productivity. And so then the question becomes, why? Why is that? Why is this all of a sudden happening? Well, it's, it's rooted in fear. It's rooted in fear in the bottom line, both of those. They're timid about holding their younger workforce accountable because they're afraid they'll leave. Maybe not even leave as an individual, but leave as a group, a team. And they know the struggle of replacing them. So all of a sudden, accountability has begun to fade a little bit in an effort to keep this younger workforce in the building. But I can tell you that the the pushing back on accountability is actually pushing the younger workforce out of the building. There's another way to look at this. The younger workforce, I see it every single day, they're begging, they're crying out for leaders, hold us accountable for productivity. They want to be held accountable for productivity. However, accountability in a lot of leaders' minds, including mine, up until a couple of years ago, looked like the same paradigm that it's been, you know, all of our lives, which is hierarchical from the top to the bottom. Accountability today is reciprocal from through to, from the company, through the employees, back to the company. So what's happening is, is the younger workforce is saying, hold us accountable for productivity, but here is the new experience. And this is what sets this workforce apart from all of the generations before whether we want to call it nervesy or courage or whatever we want to do, there's a lot of other choice words I could say there. But this workforce is now holding the company or the organization accountable for structures of success. What they're saying is, we came to work for your company for a reason. We believe in your mission. We're passionate for your mission. And ultimately, we want to succeed. But what we need from you, we will be held accountable for productivity. We will optimize your productivity, but we need a couple things in place in order for us to succeed and to optimize that productivity. But what we know, what what I know from experience and also the research is when companies stick hard line to that hierarchical form of accountability and don't provide those simple practical structures of success to this younger workforce, they don't stay. Now, now keep this in mind. In January 2020, the average, we'll just stick to millennial for a minute. The average millennial stayed on the job 16 months. I drew a line of delineation in January 2020 because I wanted to see if the if the workforce would return post-pandemic to the same type of tendencies. What I know today in the research is that the average millennial stays on the job only 11 months. But to make it even worse, what I also know is that those that leave at 11 months or 12 months or even 16 months, what I do know is this, that those that leave have already filled out an application, a resume, a CV at the six month mark to leave the organization. And so then the question becomes, why? If you believe in the mission of the company, you know, you have a great wage, you have, you know, what you would define as good leaders What in the world at six months would make you make this decision to fill out a resume or an application or a CV to move on to the next position? It's all about that accountability structure. It's all about that that, that engagement structure and that retention structure. What we know is this. They get in your building. They get in your company. They want to be held accountable for productivity. But if those structures of engagement and retention are not there, which in their minds, they're not looking at it as engagement and retention. They're looking at it through one lens, success. So if we provide those structures of success for them, what we know is they don't even think about leaving your company. But when they're absent from there, they're moving on to the next company until they find them. So can I have learned this from you four years ago? And I've made this part of our culture here at Broadstaff and it works. I mean, it works. I have listened to every word you said and implemented it here in the company. And what I'd like you to talk about now is, you know, me, let's say we're, let's say I'm a leader, I'm hearing this and I'm saying, okay, what do I need to either add or take away from my company culture 
that is going to help me to attract, engage, and retain this new workforce. Now, I'll give you an example. One thing that has been instrumental with us after, again, learning from you four years ago has been giving every single employee, no matter what their age or position in the company, the same voice in the company and a seat at the table, literally. And it has been a phenomenal retention strategy and you know our retention rates are through the roof here. So can you, I just want you to talk like, look at me as an employer who's a leader who's saying, okay, help me here. Give me a few strategies that I can take right now back to my company and say, okay, I need to implement these things now or I need to stop doing them. Yeah, 100%. And one of the reasons that Broadstaff and Carrie Charles and the entire team of Broadstaff I'm convinced of this beyond your phenomenal leadership and all of the leadership that my day and everybody else represents in broad staff. That one piece of voice, I see it over and over in every single company that has activated the voice of their younger workforce. We see retention rates soaring in a positive way. Now, I'll come back to that. You alluded to just a moment ago, this battle that we're dealing with in regard to working at home, working in the building. I know Elon Musk today is just blowing that up. And, you know, a lot of people are blowing that subject matter up right now. It's ironically, I just watched an interview with the shark. What's his name? Mr. Wonderful. I can't even think of his name yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And he saw it just the opposite. He sees his profitability up with, with workers at home instead of in the building because of his real estate costs and infrastructure and other things like that. The reason I bring that up is this is that there is one issue that I would pro- I would love to have a conversation with Mr. Musk and Mr. Wonderful about. What I know of, from employees working at home, the research emphatically tells me that they're struggling with engagement. And they, and listen, this younger workforce thrives on engagement. And I, let's take it even one step farther thrives on community, on collaborative community. And what we, what we, if we're not careful, we, we isolate and compartmentalize individuals in their homes. And all of a sudden community begins to, the fabric of community begins to tear and the cohesiveness, cohesiveness of collaboration begins to dissipate in our company. And for most of us, that collaboration and that community is key to making sure and, you know, ensuring that our workforce is growing and, and helping us, you know, grow our bottom line. So that engagement piece, I cannot, I cannot emphasize this enough to every single leader that's listening to this podcast. You have to get employee engagement right, whether they're at home or in the building. That employee engagement piece is developed around one idea, community. How do we develop community? Well, what the research shows us, the practical solution is through a mentorship structure. And when we have a mentorship structure, not the old wise sage speaking into the young doe or buck, small group, whole life focused, keeping each other accountable, developing a culture of accountability with some cohesiveness, collaboration, transparency, vulnerability, all of those things happening there. What we know is this. That that employees are not leaving companies where there's a thriving mentorship structure. Actually, those employees are not only getting healthier from a whole life perspective, their levels of what we know from measuring it, because we have metrics in place, their levels of productivity are exponentially increasing when we have a healthy, thriving mentorship structure. Now, to your point about the voice. That goes to the retention piece. When we intentionally activate the voice of this younger workforce, and what I mean by that is not not a box, you know, on the wall, not an occasional conversation at the water fountain or over lunch, nothing like that. When we have intentional environments to activate that voice, what we know is, is that streams, new streams of revenue are being generated for the company that most leaders did not know that was there, did not know how to activate. Did not know how to implement. And I know that's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of leaders. But ultimately, that activated voice, along with that mentorship structure, not only keeps employees in the building, it increases profitability and revenue 
for the company. That younger workforce will be your leadership moving forward. And if we're not engaging them and retaining them, we're going to struggle with leadership moving forward. And I'll even argue, and I know I'm speaking the language to a lot of leaders, if that younger workforce is not becoming your leadership, you're going to struggle with profitability and revenue moving forward. Yes, yes. So activating the voice of the younger workforce. So give me mm-hmm. one example of how I can do that. We started an event about four years, almost five years ago now. It's called Create to Elevate Events. What we do is we divide the company, into, whether we be a department, be a company, whatever, up into teams of three to five people. And what we do is we coach them through a, a, a two-month process. It starts with idea generation. In other words, we plant this seed in them and say, If there's any one thing that you know that would elevate the company or elevate the customer experience with the company or elevate your job or whatever, to just improve things, not complain, just to improve things. And then we collectively put these groups of three to five people in a room and they come up with an idea to elevate, whether it be the department, the customer experience, the company as a whole, whatever. Then what we do is we coach them through a process of implementation, financial cost, you know, forecasting, all of those things. And then the last coaching piece is we coach them on how to present that idea because here's the activated voice piece. We have an event that looks like Shark Tank on steroids where every single group that came up with an idea, who understands all the nuances of it, who now understands how to present this idea, they come to a stage. They have five, maybe sometimes 10, depending on the size of the company, minutes to present their idea. The leadership is sitting in front of them. They they quiz them or ask questions about the idea. They step off. The next group comes on. At the end of the event, the top award or three top idea or top three ideas are rewarded. What I know is this, that every company that we've done a Create to Elevate event event in, they want to do it every single year. They want it to be annual. And there's a couple of reasons for it, because they know it keeps the employees in the building, that whole collective community, and this adds a competitive component to it. It keeps employees engaged in it. They're talking about those ideas. Their eyes are open. Their hearts are open. Their minds are open to ideas of how we can improve the company all through the year because they're looking for that Create Elevate event because they want to win. They want those prizes and those rewards over the next year. They also want to look at their, you know, their coworker and talk some smack and say, hey, I won this year, not you. But the leader sees it differently. That's The leader sees that as a healthy piece, but the leader sees it a little bit differently. And I'll give you an example. One of my clients, a landscape architecture engineering firm, They do a Create and Elevate event every year. I think they just did it for the fourth year. And some of the streams of revenue that have come from them have been $10 million plus. So brand new streams of revenue that have come from their employees, that were their employees' idea, and the leaders themselves said, we would have never thought about it. And not only would we have never thought about it, they brought us the entire package of this idea. We know exactly what we have to do to implement it, and we feel pretty confident about the outcomes to it. As a result, they give their employees, the winners, some pretty significant trips and automobiles and everything else every year for the Create to Elevate events because the streams of revenue are je- are far outpacing the the amount of reward that's coming to those particular employees. That's how we activate the voice. That's the most effective way we have that we have found to activate the voice. And and Carrie, let me just say one more thing to it. I want to say I want to say this to every single leader. There are things that you are doing, whether it be a July 4th barbecue, a three-legged light race, I don't care what it is. There's a lot of things you're doing that you think that are bringing people together. And I'm not, I'm not Throwing that under the bus, as bad as it sounds, they do work. But I promise you, not one employee stays in your company because of your July 4th barbecue. Not one. Not one company stays because you take them to the mountains in a cabin. Not one thinks about that when they think about leaving the company. So I'm just arguing, take those same resources, invest them in something that we know that keeps them in the company, which is activating their voice, which ultimately pays for itself. It's a no-brainer. And so I'm encouraging leaders to engage that mindset because, and then I'm sorry to say this one more thing. I know from post-event interviews, consistently what employees tell me is my voice was heard today. 
by the leaders of my company. My ideas were respected today. And that piece alone is the most valuable piece of the event, knowing that their ideas and their, their mindsets were heard and respected by the leaders or the owners of their company. You know, Kent, it sounds to me like that we as leaders need to think differently. Just like you said, I mean, there's nothing wrong with barbecues. Okay, I love barbecue and country music, but you know, that leaders need to think differently and say, okay, what does this new workforce want? What do they need? And then yeah. we craft our culture and our programs and, you know, experiences based on though meeting those needs. And I think that's the bottom line. Let me ask you in closing one thing. If, 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 if we could, a leader could, we could just take one thing and we could take it right into our companies and use it today. What would you say that we should, we should do, do be or have? Mentorship structure. Without a doubt, mentorship structure is the biggest piece of the solution. Remember, employee engagement is king. And th there's a backside of that. I believe, just based on the research and the implementation experience, the new metric of growth with this younger workforce is a culture of accountability. That's the new metric of growth. And I believe that everything else, or what I've witnessed is everything else flows out of that culture of accountability. A mentorship structure breeds a culture of accountability. Does it happen overnight? No, it's a process. But once we get down the road in that process, that culture of accountability begins to impact every single corner and nuance of our company. And then we follow it with activating the voice. So I would, I would encourage every leader, every leader, engage in a mentorship structure. If you need any ideas, you need any guidance, you need any instruction about how to do that. I'm encouraging you to reach out to me and I can provide that guidance for you. Well, Dr. Kent, that's a great segue to find out how can we learn more about or how can we contact you? Also, I just wanted to add too that you can contact me as well. Retention Partners is a sister company of Broadstaff. And, uh, you know, Dr. Kent, since he's come into our lives and my life has really helped me to become a better leader. So I thank you for just pouring your heart out today to all, you know, to our audience. I know this has helped, but how can we reach you and also reach Retention Partners? Two ways. Get started at retentionpartners.com. Get started at retentionpartners.com. When you go to get started at retentionpartners.com, there's a very short intake form. You fill that out. It comes back to me. I want to build a relationship with you. I will tell you, I'm not, and I know Carrie's not, we're not consultants that, that are just kind of breezing in and breezing out. We want to build relationships with you because we know that relationship is ultimately going to culminate in your growth and your productivity and your revenue and profitability, all that. So get started at retentionpartners.com, or you can just simply go to retentionpartners.com. Or the last piece, you can go to drkent.wessinger at retentionpartners.com. Any one of the three ultimately gets to me. And I'll tell you what, you are not kidding when you said that you will help anyone and you talk to everyone. I mean, it has been just a pleasure knowing you, Dr. Kent. Thank you for being on the show today. I know we've provided, you've provided incredible value for the audience. And I, I'm just, thank you for coming on. And I hope we can do this again in the future. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm not going to apologize for being passionate about helping people grow. <laughs> I want leaders to grow and solve their workforce crisis. So thank you, Carrie. Appreciate the I opportunity. I love it. I love it. All right. I will see you soon. Take care. Thank you for listening to another informative episode of 5G Talent Talk brought to you by RCR Wireless News, Telecom Careers, and Broadstaff Talent Solutions. As we advance into the future, we promise to bring you the resources you need to navigate this ever-changing landscape of 5G to help you attract, retain, and engage people in this new world of work. To access the show notes or leave a review, visit broadstaffglobal.com. Until next time.